So, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everyone, to all of you joining us from different parts of the world. And thank you very much for joining us today in our first Migration Policy Center webinar of 2021. Today, we're going to be talking about borders, mobilities, and immobilities in Southern Africa. This is a central topic nowadays, given that most migration and mobility in Africa happens within the continent. Today, we'll have two presentations that will explore regular and irregular forms of mobility and immobility and the role that borders play in these dynamics. We are very pleased to welcome two recognized experts on the topic who will tell us about two different dynamics taking place at Southern African borders. I will introduce the presenters to you now in the order in which they will present. First, we will have Francis Musoni, who is an associate professor at the University of Kentucky. He will be talking about border champion and migration control in Southern Africa. Then we will have Kudakwashi Banyuro, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the African Center for Migration and Society at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. He will talk about the temporalities of immobile Zimbabwean migrants at the Zimbabwe South Africa border. We remind both presenters that they will have a maximum of 20 minutes for their presentations and then we'll have Q&A. I remind also to all the attendants that you can write your questions in the chat on the right side of your screen down there on YouTube. I will now give the floor to Francis Musoni. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Lisa. I am going to begin by uh, sharing my uh, screen. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for, for the introductions. And may I also take this opportunity to thank Andrew, uh, Kiara, and everyone at the Migration Policy Center who helped to organize this event. Many thanks as well to my co-panelist, Kuda. I look forward to your presentation as well. To everyone who is uh, tuning in uh, today, I say welcome and thank you for taking your time to be on this uh, webinar. So as you can see, I'm uh, uh, going to talk about uh, you know, kind of slightly different topic, but uh, quite related to what uh, you heard from the introductions. The Zimbabwe South Africa border and what I call, what I see as an illegalized mobilities in Southern Africa. So um, I want to begin by just uh, introducing uh, the book that, uh, you know, is, that forms the basis of what I'm going to be talking about today. So this is my book that uh, was published uh, in April last year. What basically I, I seek to do in this book is to um, explore the history of border jumping or illegalized mobilities across the Zimbabwe South Africa border from its inception as a colonial boundary in 1890 to the early 2000s. So basically my presentation today will rely mostly on the materials that I gathered while researching for, for this book. But before I go further with my talk, I want us to take a very quick look at the events that took place at the Zimbabwe South Africa border over the past few days and weeks. So what you see on this slide is a very long queue of vehicles waiting to be cleared on the South African side of the border so they could cross into Zimbabwe. This pileup uh, began a few days before Christmas uh, in last December, as thousands of people, mostly South Africa-based Zimbabweans, returned home for the holidays. Some reports, some of the reports that I've seen allege that at some point, the queue stretched for more than 15 kilometers. And some say, uh, some, you know, actually some people uh, waited for more than five days to be cleared. I've also seen reports suggesting that at least 11 people died while waiting in this queue. However, I must say that I've not been able to verify some of these uh, reports as uh, factually uh, correct. But just after um, 
the new year, we saw a similar scenario as vehicles pile up, piled up again, initially on the Zimbabwean side of the border, which is what you see on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the photograph uh, on, the, on top, uh, but eventually on the South African side as well. Inevitably, uh, some of the affected people resorted to using unofficial channels leading to the arrests and the deportations of hundreds of them. As you can see on the uh, picture on the bottom, those are people who are trying to use uh, other avenues, like basically going via the bush to avoid the official uh, uh, exit, and port, um, uh, exit and entry uh, port at the Bay Bridge uh, border post. So in an attempt to manage the chaos, the South African Minister of Home Affairs visited the border and gave a statement in which he said, illegal crossings of the border undermined his country's sovereignty. The minister then promised to, to deploy uh, police boats on the Limpopo River, uh, which is the river that runs uh, you know, between the two countries, along the border between the two countries, and also to deploy uh, army helicopters to patrol the border. Now, I followed uh, these events with interest hoping to hear uh, what policymakers understood to be the major drivers or the major driver of this crisis and how it could be fixed. Unfortunately, I did not hear much in this regard from the South African or Zimbabwean government officials. So I'm going to talk about what I see as some of the, the major drivers. In fact, uh, before I get there, uh, here's what I saw uh, from uh, some of the people who commented on these developments in the mainstream and social media. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that they uh, saw as the major uh, drivers of uh, the crisis that we have seen uh, at the border between these two countries. The first and by far the most cited problem in this uh, in the ongoing econ is the ongoing economic crisis in Zimbabwe that has generated high levels of unemployment and general conditions of poverty and insecurity in that country. And this has been going on for uh, almost two decades now. And the second is what some people see as the failure of South Africa's post-apartheid government to secure the country's borders. Some of course uh, obviously blamed the two countries uh, poorly ma managed efforts to contain the spread of uh, COVID-19 through extra screening requirements that drastically slowed down traffic at the border. Although I do not doubt these factors or that these factors contributed to the chaos that we saw over the past few weeks, I think that placing too much focus on them is being short-sighted. And here's why I say so. From the research uh, that I've carried out for my book, I've learned that making a distinction between factors that push people from one country to another and those that force or encourage migrants to cross borders without following official channels helps to better understand the connection between border jumping and the politics of migration control. While it makes sense, for example, to argue that the economic recession that Zimbabwe has grappled with since the late 1990s compelled many citizens of that country to move to South Africa. I argue that the recession did not cause migrants to use unofficial channels in crossing the border between these two countries. In fact, most of the people whose experiences I discuss in my book revealed that they only resorted to border jumping after being denied or having found it difficult to obtain the permits that would have allowed them to use official channels. The problem I find with the argument that the government of post-apartheid South Africa has failed to secure the country's borders is the inherent assumption that tightening border controls helps to eradicate illegal migration. I just don't think that this is true. In fact, my research shows that rather than eliminating border jumping, previous attempts um, to restrict mobility across the Zimbabwe-South Africa border actually encouraged the use of fraudulent documents and other unofficial channels. 
Then there is the impression that has been created that um, illegal migration between these two countries is a recent development that's, that has no history beyond the ongoing economic recession in Zimbabwe. Well, guess what? There's lots of evidence in the Zimbabwean and South African archives showing that the two countries have actually struggled with illegalized mobilities across the, uh, the Limpopo River since the colonial occupation of the Zimbabwean Plateau in 1890. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the next uh, few slides. In fact, uh, it was the British sponsored occupation of Zimbabwe that resulted in the reconfiguration of what previously was an ordinary river, the Limpopo River, running across the Venda territory, as you can see on the, on the map on, the, uh, on my slide. Uh, and this colonial occupation, you know, turned this river into a juridical divide between two competing polities. By 1900, the colonists, that is on the Zimbabwean side, on the, uh, you know, um, on the Zimbabwean plateau, they had introduced various measures to restrict the movement of people across the Limpopo, such as requiring border uh, labor agents wishing to recruit workers from the Zimbabwean plateau, which they renamed Southern Rhodesia for employment in the Transvaal to pay much more in registration and license fees than those who recruited for local employment. And occasionally deploying the police to arrest recruiters operating in the border region without the necessary permits. So in seeking to establish a new order uh, in the region, these measures disrupted pre-existing patterns of uh, cross limpopo mobility that had become a way of life for communities astride the river, as well as an, an, an important source of livelihoods for migrant workers in the region. So over the years, what you see is that uh, the Zimbabwe-South Africa border evolved as a site of multi-sided, multi-layered contestations, which made it possible for border jumping to thrive from the 1890s to pretty much the present. Now I'm going to talk about uh, some of these uh, contestations. So these contestations can be seen at several levels, but uh, for the purpose of uh, this presentation, I will just talk about the friction between policymakers in Southern Rhodesia and later Zimbabwe and their counterparts in South Africa. Who, you know, so you see, what you see is that the policymakers on you know, either side of the, the, the border have had different and at times conflicting understandings of cross Limpopo mobility. The major challenge here is that most of the border management policies that we have seen in this region were formulated in response to pressure from interest groups, such as business owners and labor unions in both countries. For example, from the 1890s to the late 1950s, Southern Rhodesian policymakers under immense pressure from mine owners and farmers in their country, deployed various strategies in an attempt to, imp uh, to import migrant workers from Zambia and Malawi. Basically, they were trying to open up the North, their northern border while restricting migration to South Africa. Meanwhile, South African policymakers did very little to control the movement of people back and forth across the Limpopo River because uh, business owners in their country lobbied for an open border policy. In 1913, for example, leaders of the South African Labour Party, which was the biggest opposition in, in parliament, uh, succeeded in getting the government to announce a ban on so-called tropical workers. These are basically migrants from north of the Limpopo from north of 22 degrees, uh, latitude 22 degrees south, which is basically north of the Limpopo, who were you know, seen as uh, being uh, at risk uh, in the uh, dying in, in larger numbers in the mines and also in other places uh, in, in South Africa. However, government officials refused to strictly enforce the ban, thereby allowing businesses to employ people from the restricted areas who ended the country often with the help of licensed and unlicensed recruiters. 
South African authorities also spend Southern Rhodesia's efforts to organize a regional migration control mechanism during the 1930s, uh, 40s, and 50s, bowing to pressure from the Transvaal Chamber of Mines, which insisted that there should be free movement of people, basically free movement of labor in the region. It was not until the early 1960s that South African authorities began to openly call or openly resist calls for the free movement of people in the region and imposed restrictions on migrations from Southern Rhodesia and other countries north of the Limpopo River. Although rising unemployment among the Black South Africans might have contributed to the shift in the country's border management strategies, the militarization and of anti-apartheid and anti-colonial struggles in the region played a big role here. In a bid to stop infiltration by MK fighters who were receiving military training abroad, South African policymakers and their counterparts in Southern Rhodesia worked together in managing cross Limpopo mobilities from the mid 1960s to the late 1970s. However, with the end of white rule in Zimbabwe in 1980, tension between the two countries re-emerged, leading to the construction of an electrified fence on the South African side of the border. Since this also coincided with the escalation of the civil war in Mozambique, the fence was extended to cover a long stretch of the South Africa-Mozambique border as well. When apartheid rule came to an end, in 1994, relations between Zimbabwe and South Africa um, in, you know, greatly improved, but the, latter, but the latter kept a stringent visa regime, which made it difficult for Zimbabweans to travel back and forth across the border. It was only in 2009, following South Africa's ratification of the SADC protocol on the facilitation of movement of persons, that the government scrapped off the visa requirements for Zimbabweans visiting the country for periods not exceeding 90 days. This significantly reduced instance of illegalized mobilities between the two countries. Now, as I, conc as I conclude my presentation, I would like to highlight some of the uh, ideas I developed in my work. The first, the first one is that I see border jumping or illegalized mobilities from, uh, South Africa, from Zimbabwe to South Africa as a reflection of trends in other regions of the world where a country with a struggling economy shares a border with a more developed country. However, I think that to view this practice as simply a product of poverty, unemployment, and other conditions of insecurity in countries of migrants' origins is too simplistic. Also, Rather than viewing border jumpers simply as lawbreakers, which they are in most cases, I think we should seek to understand the historical and structural conditions that make it difficult for people to follow official channels when traveling from one country to another. Furthermore, in saying that border jumping is one of the lasting legacies of the colonial partition of Africa, I'm also arguing that this practice will prevail until Africa's borders are decolonized. In other words, it will take a complete removal of all forms of restrictions on people's movements across Africa for the challenges associated with border jumping to be um, addressed effectively. I'll end here and uh, uh, we can discuss more during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis, for this super interesting presentation with historical perspective. I remind all the attendants that you can write your questions on the right side of your screen, and all your comments are very much welcome. I now give the floor to Kuda. Um, thank you, Laser, and thank you, Francis, for the opening to this. Um, webinar and thanks to everyone who managed to come and join and listen to this discussion. So I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, let me try. I seem to be having a bit of a challenge. Oh, there we go. 
and I hope everyone can see that. Um, so I would like to begin uh, this talk with uh, the following epigraph. So just after six o'clock on one September morning in 2019, close to 60 Zimbabwean migrants staying at a men's shelter in the border town of Messina gathered at the robot which is sort of the equivalent term of traffic lights in, in this part of the world to market themselves to peace job recruiters. And this is a term that they used to describe an open space that was about 50 meters um, just outside the shelter where, where many men would wait hoping to find long-term employment. There was a truck and the owner was a, this is the, the space where the men would, ga would gather. Um, to, to wait for, for truck owners who would come and, and, and try to hire them. And in this space, there was a truck owner and a contractor who was hire, hiring only five workers to work as what they call DACA boys, who are men that mix cement for making bricks on a small building project. The 60 were all competing for a few jobs to earn money for food and soap, and in the long run, to raise money for transport to go to Polokwane, Johannesburg, or Cape Town. And so as to be expected, there was a somewhat chaotic jostling around the truck. And one of the senior men who was staying at the shelter, his name is Gogwe, came out of the yard and instructed the men to maintain some kind of order. So he entered the car and began cordially chat chatting to the truck owner. And in no time, he had managed to select four other men for the job who jumped back into the back of the truck and which all happened oblivious to the queue where many were waiting somewhat dutifully. This shelter is a space that is meant to hold irregular Zimbabwean migrant men as they raise enough money to transport for transport to travel further south while residing alongside asylum seekers from DRC and Burundi who are waiting as well for their asylum papers. So what you see on your left is the church and what you see on, on, on your right is the is a zinc uh, common kind of structure where uh, many of the men sleep. Um, patronage and seniority seem to trump other concerns in this kind of space as life experiences differed by length of stay, making time an important aspect of these men's life, of these men's lives. For example, there were those that had been staying at the shelter for longer than a year who had assumed considerable influence over the hiring process and developed enduring relationships with recruiters, contractors, and employers. Um, and those who stayed for long, for example, would often be rewarded with a security guard position. And so in this sense, we can kind of read length of stay as a form of capital that influenced rights and claims. Um, such as comfortable accommodation and one's level of authority. And I will show how this plays out uh, throughout the presentation. Um, and within this space, one also would find those who would be staying for up to three months who would quickly realize that they had limited rights, authority and claims um, and quickly adapted to their situation. Some of these men would attach immense value to basic needs like food, shelter, and soap needed to sustain themselves in the present until they secured money to travel for a better future elsewhere. Some had been at the shelter before and were using the shelter as a space to, to sort of um, make their way um, when they've run out of money. And also others were, were coming out for the first time into South Africa. And, and therefore, they also relied on the word of mouth to locate some of the religious leaders and institutions they used for their physical protection. In this way, their immobility was a way to evade worse off suffering in Zimbabwe. And even after sleeping on the floor in a shelter where residents had to contest to access water and petty theft and bullying were common, they still acknowledged that their living conditions at home were far better. And much comfortable. So for these men, um, staying in this shelter for up to three months was, was also a kind of a strategy. I argue that in these multiple scenarios, waiting is a component of both governing Zimbabwean migrants as well as them seeking agency. And in this way, the Zimbabwe South African border can be read as an ambivalent time space that facilitates 
both care and control, which leads Zimbabwean migrant men to experience temporal limbo, as well as cope by developing a tolerance for contradictions and ambiguity, as well as temporal strategies for sustaining some of these contradictions. And I'd like to begin by locating this argument within some overarching readings of African borderlands and even immobility is they're crucial to the kind of argument I would like to make about this multiplicity. So we, we see if, uh, on the one end that scholars of African borders have different con conceptions with some arguing that borders are spaces of integration from below um, and that um, and, and some arguing that borders are somewhat um, arbitrary and they are a colonial construction. I think, which is a point that uh, Francis has, has also made reference to. And I think you have some of that in, in front of you, who some of those scholars probably are. Uh, and then we also find um, scholarship that talks about how um, borders are somewhat paradoxical um, and one may find that patterns of alienation and coexistence prevail at the same time, um, depending on, on, the, on the different situations at hand. Um, and then the literature on uh, immobility and agency, particularly coming from, 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 from a perspective of waiting, really comes from how waiting has become um, a form of sort of governance or has really been a form of governance for the longest time from waiting for a bus on a queue for a passport stamp or waiting for a COVID certificate or for asylum processing. Um, so this kind of instructs us to take interest in the relationship between immobility and, and agent, agency through this optic. And one can identify some conceptions of waiting as victimization that scholars such as Oyero 2011 would argue uh, re results in the urban poor becoming uh, patients of the state. Um, and I think in its most extreme expression, this view of waiting as a dead end rhythm can be found in the work of Bowman when he conceptualizes the refugee camp as something akin to government's total institution that strips refugees of their identities to make them zomb zombies. I think Agam Agamben's work as well around refugees in camps as the ultimate biopolitical subject um, is also key to some of this thinking. There are also scholars who kind of see waiting as agency and propose the conceptualization of the event through the perspective of embodied corporal experience um, in a way that allows us to perceive bodily practice um, and also how people wait. Um, and what activities they undertake rather than simply taking the immobility for, for um, a lack of agency. And then there are those who argue about waiting as doubleness, stating that waiting must not only be understood as the capacity to write out, to write out the passage of time um, or the absence of action. For example, in South African cities, old feet and, and grailing challenge Oyeru's perception of um, migrants uh, or people who are in waiting as being patients of the state or the urban poor in various context. Um, rather, uh, these cities are characterized by a combination of state authority and individual agency. Having looked at this literature, I, I would argue that reconciling this body of work is important and um, using an immobility framework to study African borders can re reveal the special temporal ambiguities, amb ambivalences and multiplicities of border regimes that so easily get lost in flame framings of migrants as victims or victors. And in the case of the Zimbabwe South Africa border, this approach allowed me to make three observations that are based from my own uh, uh, doctoral work. First of all, um, humanitarian action by actors like the UNHCR and IOM in this border regime does not necessarily strike me as a challenge to the power and authority of the bureaucratic state, um, but an extension of the policing and governance of migrants. And I think this is something that has also been found in other border contexts in Europe, uh, particularly when it has to do with sort of patrolling um, humanitarian actors who are also patrolling the sea and, and patrolling the borders. Um, uh, um, 
we and and I think this uh, this calls for one to move beyond sort of a dichotomous idea of sovereignty, sovereignty which presumes that the actions of non-state actors are an assault on the legitimacy of the state, um, because there are some linkages we find between secu securitization imperatives and humanitarian care, uh, which allow the humanitarian actors to govern through an assemblage of logics, norms, rationalities, and categories of migration management to quote outsiders in the name of the bureaucratic state's legislation. And so these forms of um, control intertwine with the internal social categorizations to reproduce uh, what Fasin would call a regime of ambivalent hospitality that um, scholars like Moreno Lax and Pakistan Wilkins and Tiktin would, 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 would call um, sort of something that leads to simultaneous care and control. Um, so in the particular case of the Zimbabwe South African border, for example, there's an uneasy alliance between humanitarian actors and bureaucratic state actors, which have resulted in an informal agreement that makes migrants staying in this shelter the responsibility of humanitarian organizations. However, they, 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 there's also dictates around the amount of time or the, they can stay the freedom to move that they have and the access to productive spaces that they have when they are in Messina. Um, um, and they can be arrested and deported. Um, and this is evident in the distinctions as well that humanitarian actors make between forced and economic migrants, vulnerable and powerful subjects to define political and social subjectivities of uh, care and deservingness, which lead um, in this instance, different kinds of migrants um, to receiving less care um, than, than, than for example, those that the state perceives as forced migrants. And Zimbabweans so happen to be one of that category. So you find a selective kind of inclusion as it were, where um, people are staying in the same shelter, but Zimbabweans are not necessarily seen as UNHCR persons of concern, um, or, the, or the IAM might, might see them as you know, persons of concern when it comes to, vote to, to, to return, but not necessarily when it comes to getting certain forms of assistance. So, so, so we, we can talk about how then this is also a form of categorizing and governing people within these spaces. Um, and I think these ambivalent politics of care also shape how Zimbabwean migrants experience a sort of minimal biopolitical regime to use the terms of uh, terminology of Redfield, um, which is really linked to how humanitarian assistance preserves biological life, but really hinders an existence consistent with any form of, uh, of dignity. So unlike sort of purely productive uh, biopolitical modes of governance, um, this, this humanitarian action suspends life by simply preserving and maintaining a structurally marginalized life. And this is really evident in the scarcity of water, lack of food and crowded and uncomfortable living conditions at the shelter. Making the men wait in this space also subjects them to, to power because it dictates their personal rhythms and needs, and they feel dependent and subordinate upon the bishop who owns and runs and runs this, this shelter. Um, and, and during this delay, there's also a lot of feelings of lost time, being left behind, and fears of social death that also draw on social and cultural conceptions related to Zimbabwean masculinities in which men are providers. Um, however, I think the last, um, the last uh, point I, I would like to make is that this power is not necessarily, um, this biopower is not totalizing and it is minimal at best. And this is evinced by how Zimbabwean migrant men are still able to use waiting to turn immobility into a resource for action by adopting temporal migration strategies uh, within a, a, a uh, conditions of great uncertainty and, and conditions of limited time sovereignty. Um, so a majority of the men would find ways of, um, of living for the future by not investing valuable resources such as time, energy and money for religious activities because staying is something they consider short term and they do not stay longer than three months. So they will not invest in their bedding. They will not invest in anything of that sort. Um, uh, for example, within three months of staying at the shelter, one of the men 
uh, had deferred his Christian beliefs because attending services while hungry was somewhat a temporal luxury because it took the time he could be using to work. It required offerings and prayer requests, monies he didn't have or it spent or it or had spent time he no longer had working for. Um, by doing this, he, he had then managed to work and raise enough money to travel to Johannesburg. And this photo here is an image of the sleeping area in the, the corrugated iron shelter that MSF built at the shelter where these men who stay for shorter periods tend to stay. So these are some of the sleeping conditions. However, we, we find few others like Gogwe, who are, whom I introduced at the beginning, resorting to a sort of presentism uh, because they start between a traumatic past and an unfathomable, unfathomable future. For example, some of these men can't return home because they are being persecuted by the government or they're wanted for whatever reason, and they also can't move forward. For example, one of the men who was not willing to go to Johannesburg because of xenophobia, of the fear of xenophobia. So these men invest in, um, in laying claims in the shelter in, in, in doing their time. And then the, the building that you're seeing here is a structure where, it's, where these men, the eight to 10 few that are in this kind of position um, sleep. So, and one of the men even has, has had to, has had like a, even has a bedroom in there. And sometimes um, um, I would bump into the, you know, like a, a female person, kind of a woman coming through to see him and whatnot and whatnot, which is not necessarily the rights that other people are necessarily afforded while they're staying there. Um, so I would like to offer some conclusions based on some of these um, both empirical and theoretical um, issues that I, I, I've raised. Um, first of all, the intersections of immobility and this temporal agency show that the relationship between resistance and domination in border waiting uh, is somewhat ambivalent. And rather than constituting men, the men as bare lives, it might produce something akin to what Ramsey calls a temporal state of exception, which, which, which leads to some kind of a minimalist humanity in which imposed forces makes assumptions about the future precarious. So this existential rapture, as Ramsey calls it, leaves room for some possibility of maneuver and agency. Hence, I also understand the border. I think I found uh, my Walters and Williams conceptualization of the humanitarian border is, is useful in, in thinking about how that border is evolving or has somewhat uh, evolved into a space that generates a hybrid sovereignty and political order that 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 does both that is permeable and at the same time secured and, and it, uh, this allows it to to care and control uh, and, and through a, a sort of a secret solidarity as Duff would call it between humanitarianism and sovereign power in which humanitarianism becomes complicit with sovereignty and, and border processes so for me, this border cannot easily be understood as an extreme that either controls human beings totally or acts as a center of, at the margins that allow for integration from below. It's more of a paradox or a conundrum where patterns of alienation and coexistence prevail at the same time, depending on, 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 on concrete and shifting. Uh, I think the aspect of shifting is really important because, uh, for example, the example that Francis gave about the conditions of waiting that took place within the past a month or so. So we can really see how that, that, that border sort of gives, breeds um, uh, a lot of dynamism in terms of how people are controlled. So, so it becomes a little bit difficult to also speak about it in, in, in isolation or, you know, in, 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 in static terms. So with that said, I think I'll end it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuda, for this fascinating presentation. I thank you to both of you. Now, we have several questions to ask you, so we will ask rounds of questions if you agree with that. Um, I will begin by a question by Andrew, who would like to ask Francis about the politicization of the South Africa-Zimbabwe border and of migration in South Africa. 
Specifically, he would like to know which are the issues that are salient in the public debate and to what extent there are assumptions that were presented about illegalized mobilities, supported or challenged in public debate by who and who by. Then we have a question for both by Samuel Okunade, who would like to know that given the economic disparity that exists between Zimbabwe and South Africa, would you, like, would you say that there's a strain on the border relations between both countries? Uh, then he would like to know how you feel issues of irregular migration and documented migrants uh, can be approached and possibly curbed, bearing in mind the current situation at the Bight Bridge border. We have a third question by Loren Landau, who asks, how does the focus on borders speak to questions of methodological nationalism? Um, both of you challenge the borders as unnatural, but the accounts also speak to their conceptual and, pra and practical power. We have a last question for this round, then we will make another round if it's possible. Natalia Sintra asks, if you could please expand on the concept of humanitarian border and hybrid sovereignty, drawing on the example of the Zimbabwe South Africa border. Uh, if we follow the order of the presentations, then Francis has the floor. Okay, uh, I, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask uh, a little bit of, uh, um, if you could reread the, the first question by Andrew. Yes, of course. Andrew asks you, to um, elaborate on the politicization of the South Africa Zimbabwe border and migration in South Africa. Are the issues salient in the public debate? Um, border and migration? And to what extent are the assumptions that were presented about illegalized mobilities supported or challenged in public debate and who by? Okay, I will, I will take that first. Um, if, if I, um, I had the, the question uh, correctly about the politicization of the, the border and okay, are the issues, maybe the assumptions that were. Okay, um, what, what, what you, you see here is, I mean, the, the way I see this is, is that um, they, they, there is a lot that is going on um, on the on the streets of uh, South Africa, uh, that is uh, relevant to what we are discussing here, and as far as the Zimbabwe South Africa border itself is concerned, and how it's managed, but also the uh, the issue of migrants in general in in South Africa. Uh, I, I, and, and also in the in the mainstream media in South Africa, what you you seem to get is this this narrative or rhetoric of uh, porous borders that borders are too easy to cross, and this ties in with one of the the major object observations that I also saw with, with the recent development, where you you see people are criticizing the ANC government, the post apartheid government for. Uh, relaxing border control measures uh, since the mid 1990s to pretty much the present. So, so you see that uh, as as, a, as an issue, and uh, and I must also say that uh, you know th this is what you see in the mainstream media a lot uh, in South Africa. We see this also uh, mostly. You know this this idea is pushed a lot by the uh, the, the main opposition, the Democratic Alliance. Uh, in South Africa, I, I've seen images of some of their leaders at the border, you know, you know, you know, taking you know, pictures with, um, you know, portions of the border fence that were cut out and, and laying the blame on, on, on the ANC government and, uh, and, you know, basically saying that this is why we are having the problems that we are having. And you see, you know, if you want to take this further to the streets, you see also the same rhetorics with, um, a number of uh, uh, even you know street-based organizations. I, I've seen tweets from um, uh, you know I think South Africa First, something like that. 
and they are also raising more or less the same issues. And this is where you also see issues to do with the characterization of every uh, non-South African uh, black person in South Africa, pretty much every, every immigrant uh, being referred to as makwere kwere, uh, which is a very derogatory term, which, uh, you know, which is used a lot in, in some parts of uh, the country. And so, so there is a, a lot of uh, a politicization of uh, border controls and also a lot of politicization of uh, the presence of immigrants in South Africa to an extent that uh, sometimes you feel that a lot of people think that every immigrant, especially black immigrants, African immigrants in South Africa are all illegals, which, which, is, which is not the same, which is not the, 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 the truth. And, and so, you, you, so there's that that we, 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 we see. And um, so that's the, the, the and, and unfortunately, the NC government, the, the policymakers have not quite addressed this issue at a, at a political level. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I suspect because they, they, they are in a catch-22 uh, situation where you, you, they want to speak pan-Africanism, they want to, 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 to relate with uh, the history of these borders and how South Africa relates to the rest of the region and the continent in general, uh, speaking pan-Africanism and having this idea of free movement. But they also know that a lot of people, the electorate, the, 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 the major constituencies in South Africa are not happy with, the, with the, what is seen as the flooding of the country by uh, immigrants and who are mostly you know, seen as illegals. So that, that, that is what I see as uh, uh, the, um, the, the politicization. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, I've, I've been having kind of issues with understanding some of the questions, especially like uh, Lauren Landau's question. Can someone repeat that for me? Yes, of course. Um, Lauren asks, how does the focus on borders speak to questions of methodological nationalism? Because both of you challenge uh, borders as unnatural. Okay. Uh, but he acknowledges that um, borders also speak to their have practical or conceptual power. Okay, all right. So, I would, I would need to, to, to think a little bit about this and come back to it. I'll give Kuda a, a chance to, to respond. Okay, well, th thanks a lot for that, Francis. Um, my, the, the one question about given the economic disparities, how could one talk about the strain? Could there be a strain between Zimbabwe and South Africa? I think that that's an important question. And I think that in this is one of the things that come up in trying to map kind of temporarily or historically map the border. Um, I think one finds sort of uh, an alignment between particularly following the Zimbabwean political crisis, I think between South Africa's own um, internal um, sort of domestic policies on migration and, and policies around um, its own urban poor, somewhat um, aligned to the stance that's taken, um, if you could call it the sort of humanitarian stance around the Zimbabwean crisis. There's been a lot of ups and downs and dilly-dallying about, you know, South Africa actually referring to what's happening in Zimbabwe as a crisis. And I, I think in the period around sort of 2008, at the peak of the uh, crisis, there was a lot of um, um, humanitarian uh, non-state non actors were making the call, particularly with the cholera outbreak in Zimbabwe as well, that there is a humanitarian crisis and the humanitarian situation in, in Zimbabwe. Um, and I think particularly because of the unprecedented nature, um, it was really difficult for the government uh, at the time to, to really not acknowledge that crisis. They did, um, I think the government of national unity speaks to some of these uh, acknowledgements about the situation. And I think this links to the question of the humanitarian border because this is around the same time that we see 
um, non-state actors between the Zimbabwe South Africa border because of the way people were moving into that space uh, illegally and sleeping in the in, in the bush, um, you know, and people, you know, women getting raped and uh, cholera also spreading in different spaces. It, um, faith faith based organizations starting to to make a call that there is a situation here. We need to bring in um, we need to bring in. Um, you know, shelters, for example, we need to create shelters for people so that they can sleep or the asylum uh, papers are still being processed. And this was also coincidentally around the same time that Zimbabwe, that South Africa sort of still had a, a, a much more kind of um, a kinder approach as it were towards or kind of view of the crisis in, in Zimbabwe. Um, and this is also the time that the UNHCR opened a field office and as Fasin would argue, one can think of this as a sort of like how moral sentiments were also being deployed internationally to raise funds and to create uh, a sort of governance regime to regulate these migrants within, within Messina. But over time, as the situation becomes protracted, one sees Messina being sort of the crisis within, within that space sort of being bureau bureaucrat bureaucratized and normalized um, uh, as it were. So if you visited Messina around 20, 2012, 2008, 2012, then you go there, let's say 2014, and you go back now, you will still find migrants around, people in shelters, people being stuck, but that's been normalized as sort of um, the status quo. And, and for me, that is how the, the sort of bureaucratic immigration, humanitarian bureaucratic regime or governance regime came about um, and, and we then also need to think about how when, you, when, you, when you're looking at the situation now, um, there's somewhat some compassion fatigue as it were about Zimbabwean migrants, even that and with um, how, you know, calling Zimbabweans um, people in crisis sort of needs creates the need for the South African government to also take care of these people, right? To also register, see them as refugees. And this is a context when South Africa needs to provide for its own urban poor. And, and, and again, the politicization comes in, politicization of housing and, 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 and politicization of, uh, of health and, and, and of all kinds of social services that we can think about. So I do, um, in depth, do this kind of temporal analysis in in, in my in my own doctoral uh, work, where I kind of try to trace the linkages between then how in this context the UNHCR and the IOM then start to 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 take over the daily tasks of running in this border area, and they're the ones who um, who are working with um, implementing partners like Future Families who provide social services and um, working with lawyers for human rights. But within the mandate, there's also an alignment between how South African state views persons of concern and how the UNHCR also views them. So Zimbabweans are not necessarily UNHCR persons of concern because, because they're, not, they're not refugees by sort of South African law, um, if you could call it that. So there is, there is that alignment between, between the governance of people in, by humanitarian actors and by the bureaucratic state. And also, um, I think the, uh, there's also an alignment between sort of foreign policy and South Africa always tries to be careful about what it calls a crisis and what it doesn't, because also they, they don't want to strain these sort of old age um, patriotic front, um, freedom fighter, um, uh, mutual respect and whatever that they have, even though here and there you will hear a few people from the ANC calling out the government, but it's never on, on, on really much on paper, I think. Okay, uh, can I quickly comment on uh, uh, the, the, the question on methodological uh, nationalism uh, from uh, Prof. Landau? Uh, if I, that is, if I understood this question correctly, um, I think what I see here happening, obviously, not just at, at the Zimbabwe South Africa border, but in, in Africa more generally, is that um, you know what we have, uh, the borders that we have in, in, in Africa. I mean, they, I mean, I don't think there's anywhere in the world where we can say borders are natural. 
the borders by their nature are, are, are you know, artificial. You know, even if you have a river, you have a mountain or you have anything, we, we, you know, we, we have to call it a border for it to be a border and we have to give that meaning to it. So, but in the case of, uh, of, of Africa, most of these borders came obviously as a result of colonial conquest and uh, you know, the Berlin Conference and, and everything that uh, I think most of the people, I would assume they, they would understand. Uh, but then uh, what, you, what, you, what you see in as far as uh, African nationalism and how it gets into this is, is that uh, at the, around the, the time of um, you know, fighting for independence, you know, African countries, fought for independence within the confines of colonial borders. And they, they got their independence as basically uh, colonial uh, constructs, as, as it were. And, and what, what I'm basically arguing for, and I'm not the first one to make this argument, is that we, we, we are seeing most of the, the problems that we are seeing with the cross-border mobilities in Africa simply because uh, these borders crossed uh, uh, communities in, in Africa that have not forgotten that they, they, were, they used to be, to be one, uh, you know, even if, or that they were split by a border, which they, they see. And they, these communities still try and in many cases successfully uh, connect across borders and, and uh, this is why we end up with uh, a lot of challenges because the, you, you end up with the borders that have been prescribed in, in laws and they are being policed using, using laws, you know, and, and, and when people cross, they are being, you know, viewed as lawbreakers and, and what have you. So, so that's, that's what I see as the, the, the major challenge where you have um, um, nationalisms in Africa that in most cases are defined within the constructs of these colonial borders, except in a few cases, if you take the case of the Somalis, for example, they, they define their, their nation beyond the, the colonial borders. And that's why they've been fighting for, for generations to, 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 to have uh, uh, you know, this, this question addressed. So I don't know if this addresses uh, you know, Professor Landau's question, but I thought I should comment on it. Um, I, I also think I should just quickly just also go to that. I, I, I'd also miss that question, but quickly on that, I think that we do find ourselves in a bit of a dilemma around, you know, relying on, on sort of the border as a kind of heuristic or to understand how people are organized or how spaces are organized, how communities are organized and defining um, insiders and outsiders. and the challenge with that is that um, one then has to sort of return to that to that to that problematic construct and still say that um, we need perhaps to talk about decolonization within the context of of borders. Um, you know, I think that also raises issues because it, it's it, it is problematic to sort of return to a particular construct to still want to you know rely on it to kind of resolve your issues and that's why in South Africa we still see um, you know a certain kind of nativism that you know people will talk about decolonization and they will use it as a mantra to to talk about bringing people together but it, it also then evokes you know different identities and who it is that can belong or, who, or, or can't belong within that with it, that organizing principle that you would like to call a border. So I, I think that uh, if anything, Lauren here raises a, an important conceptual and practical dilemma that I don't think we would be able to, to simply address because I think even the idea of methodological nationalism is still um, as migration scholars returning to understand things within the, you know, the nation state as the unit of analysis um, so we, 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 I think we do have to also acknowledge some of those, those limitations and, and perhaps these are some of the spaces and opportunities for um, imaginations also that go beyond the, the sort of fixed, you know, this needs to be about decolonizing borders or not, um, because we are also finding, you know, it, it, there's also a, a kind of in terms of agency, we there's also a way in which you talk about colonial borders as if people who were part 
during that time, you know, were supposed to make the decisions for the ancestors and next generations to come as if they didn't have a say or they didn't have particular political interests that they were also looking out for. Um, so we should also be careful, I think, not to kind of uh, paint like a blank slate of uh, passive docile African leaders as well, who are simply just being told what to do. Um, because in some instances, these borders were strategic for, for certain uh, groups of uh, people. Well, thanks to both for your responses. We have time for a second round of, of questions and we have many of them. So now we ask you if you could please reply to these questions if possible in five, seven minutes. Uh, we first have a question by Poem, uh, who would like you to comment in general on the future of border governance in the region. Then we have Andrew asking Kuda if you could develop on the point that you made in the last slide in your presentation about political order that simultaneously cares and controls. Who are the actors and agents that enforce and enable this form of order and how it relates to the absence and presence of the state in border regions. Then we have a question by our colleague Paddy. Hi, Paddy. She says, well, great insights from both of you. Um, she says that there is an interesting observation on politicians not effectively dealing with discrimination towards migrants and lacking stronger stance on xenophobia. She would like to follow up on uh, Andrew's question on challenging the discourse. What is the role of sending countries in advocating the South African government on more effective approach to be visible in its immigration policy? Then we have a question by Samuel asking, what are the potential implication of, uh, implications of Africa's free trade agenda on border and migration governance between Zimbabwe and South Africa. Yeah, I would like you following up on this question. <laughs> I, I, I'm approaching the fact I'm a chair. I would like to ask you if you could comment on the free movement arrangements by SALC, if there's any relevance of regional cooperation for border controls and on um, border on free movement facilitation of mobility of regional migrants in this regard. Then we have Natalia asking if, could, if Francis could expand on what he mentioned about black migrants being seen as inherently illegal, even though untrue. Uh, Yvonne would like to ask Kuda if you could comment on the role of women. Um, and I think that's it, yeah. And Teresa would like also to comment to ask on gender implications. So if you could please sum up in the next 10 minutes, some of these questions, uh, then I will ask Kuda to begin this time with the replies. Okay, okay thank you. Well, I'm just gonna be as quick as, as I can. Um, the, the issue around sort of political borders that care and control, I think for me, I kind of begin with sort of an expansive notion of the state and I try to move away from simply perceiving the state as um, kind of people elected in government or the or a particular bureaucracy and really thinking about it as um, as, a, as a sort of um, um, a regime of governance if we could call it that and and who who is responsible for that in relation to migrants and in the Messina kind of space you find for example the the people who run the shelters who are um religious actors for example will have all sorts of noble um reasons for keeping migrants in these spaces um but at the same time they are also sort of complicit in in the counting of these migrants in having to fill um, the, the particular diaries every day, um, sorry, um, they have to fill in some kind of record as they walk in every day about who they are, where they come from, and what kind of identity they have. Um, they have to sort of, and, and the, this information is also gets used by the United, by the UNHCR in that space to determine who should be getting access to, to the kind of aid that they're giving. 
Um, and this aid is also linked to, so in, in the case of Zimbabwean migrants, for example, they, they, when the UNHCR implementing partner Future Families gives away um, some sort of support or humanitarian aid, um, for example, let's say in the form of travel subsidies, they will not give that to, to Zimbabwean migrants because of the broader classification that they're not persons of concerns because they're not refugees or asylum seekers, which is the very same kind of money that allow people to get out of these conditions of containment and stuckedness. And, 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 and I think it's, it's, it's about this, the intermeshing of all these uh, regimes uh, that lead to people being, you know, uh, governed and controlled, but at the same time with a, with a sort of a dose of, you can still have access to water, you can still have access to, to a place to sleep, even though it will not be decent enough. Um, so, so for me, I think that was the most useful way to think about it, even though one can always talk about the semantics of whether it's K control or it could be something else, right? Uh, but all I'm trying to say is that it's not sim simply one thing or a monolith. And this has, this has impacts as well on how we conceive African borders and also conceive um, um, yeah, go governance in, 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 in migration governance in, in at least in the Southern African context. Um, I, I, I'm, not gonna, I, I'm not gonna say much about free movement, except what I know is that it really works more right now for the movement of goods and it's not looking really like for people there's really much except what we see on paper obviously there might be high level things happening that we might one might be in a better position to comment on but i'm not really necessarily in that position um and then the role of women and gender so the part of the research i i then did a part of this work in a in a, in a Roman Catholic women's shelter as well. And I also did a couple of interviews and observations, even though that was not necessarily work that I used in writing my thesis, but there are a lot of gender um, uh, dynamics at play. For example, when uh, uh, particularly the conditions at the shelter, the disparities between the shelters for children and men, men seem to have it a little bit rougher where they don't even get a meal, but in the shelter for women, they do get meals. So, it, and it's obviously not as simple as also just saying that this is a sort of bifurcated regime of sort of governance that's gender based. Um, so there is more to say uh, again about how people get access to resources. And also there's also a lot of managerial stuff around lack of trust between the UNHCR, for example, in the men's shelter, uh, whereas they trust the Roman Catholic women's shelter more because apparently they have their books under control and all of that um, um, managerial um, banter, as it were. So, so one one needs to to um, I, would, I would actually like to do more and explore a little bit more on the gender stuff, uh, and I think maybe this um, um, through this. Um, um, year or the coming COVID allowing, I'll probably be able to do a little bit more to to add more of the gender stuff into the empirical material that I have. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now so that Francis can respond. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kuda. Uh, I, will, I will touch uh, very quickly on the free movement uh, agenda. And I I think this, this uh, ties, uh, you know, I, on this comment, I'm kind of addressing two questions. The one uh, relating to uh, the future of border governance and of course the implications of the, the, uh, the free uh, trade um, um, agenda. Uh, I, I would say that the, the recently um, signed and maybe launched uh, African you know, uh, free trade uh, agreement is in my view, the, the way to go for Africa. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it has been long overdue. And, uh, and um, the reason I say that is uh, most of these illegalized mobilities happen, of course, for economic reasons. Uh, and, and we need uh, Africa to, to have that freedom and just to have unhindered trade among and between you know, its, its, its countries. And uh, does this uh, mean that it's going to be a success? I, I, I don't think that that alone is going to, to help to address most of the issues that we are talking about here. Because by the way, uh, like I said, these um, 
mobilities are, of course, for economic reasons, people, you know, seeking work, you know, trade purposes, but also uh, let us not forget that there are a lot of uh, millions of uh, people who move across these borders just to, to connect with relatives who were separated from them as a result of these colonial, uh, colonially imposed uh, borders. So until and uh, unless uh, the, that also is addressed, that issue that uh, we should allow these people to freely move across Africa's borders, the free trade agenda is not going to work. It's not going to have an effect on especially like, um, I think the, 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 que the question related to potential implications on the Zimbabwe South Africa border. It's, it's not going to work for the ordinary men and women who constitute the, the largest number of people who move across this border uh, for various reasons that, that I've said, uh, I've mentioned. You need to, uh, to liberate the border. You need to decolonize it. You need to allow people to move across so that even this idea of uh, a free trade could actually be realized, not only for the elite, for big businesses, but also for the, for the, for the people on the street. If you go back to most of the, these countries, you will see that the, 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 because of uh, several challenges that they have experienced, not just Zimbabwe, uh, but many African countries, um, uh, a, a lot of, uh, um, of course, there's the high levels of unemployment, even in South Africa itself, high levels of unemployment. And a lot of people resort to uh, like home-based uh, kind of like informal trade, informal connections that, uh, that will require them to move, require them to travel, not, you know, across this border. So unless you, you also liberate that, uh, it's this free uh, trade agenda is not going to work. And then the role of uh, sending governments in probably pushing South Africa or, you know, to play a bigger role in, in this. Um, I mean, they, there's not much that Zimbabwe can do at this point in time to, to um, convince South Africa to address or to, to, to be willing to have uh, a much more free movement in the region because of course Zimbabwe is compromised already. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's up to uh, South Africa pretty much uh, to, 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 to appreciate that this is not just good for, uh, for the less developed countries, but it's also good for, for South Africa itself and for South Africa's economy. Because by the way, South Africa is, there's a lot of, um, most of the, the goods that are consumed in not just Zimbabwe, but Zambia, you know, uh, most of these countries, Malawi, they're coming from South Africa. So if you allow these people to come in and go uh, freely and legally, not illegally, it's going to be good for, for South African citizens as well, not just for, uh, for, the, for the countries that are sending a lot of these uh, migrants. And again, the issue of uh, migrants being seen as, uh, as illegals. This is what we see in the, in the mainstream media and in some publications, you see that the assumption, there is that assumption that uh, the bulk of these people, when they get targeted in these xenophobic you know, outbursts, the, there's the assumption that they are there in, in South Africa illegally. Of course, I'm saying it's not true. They are not, most of these people are not there illegally. Uh, and then of course, the, the gender implications, uh, I, what, uh, what you will see, you know, just taking again the example of the, the, the Zimbabwean case, you see that a lot of the people who move are women. And because of loss of in, you know, uh, in, in formal employment, which by the way, in colonial Africa, a woman was mostly confined in the home and not allowed to go to school and, and, and then be able to get a formal job after, after that. And a lot of that, much of that legacy is still there for Africa. And what you see now with the dwindling opportunities of formal employment in many of these countries, women are forced now to go out there to be to, to fend for their families. And they constitute the bulk of the, the people who move across these borders. And because of that, they, they become, you know, of course, victims and we, we need them to, 
uh, to you know, you know, these policymakers to also look at that part, and that will actually help again in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, like I said, in terms of uh, helping women to to do most of these uh, works that they are doing in a in a in, without a lot of these bureaucratic hindrances that in most cases even need women to be raped. We we I've come across a lot of cases in the in the uh, in the court, the, the magistrate court at Bedbridge where one woman being raped by at least five, six, 10 people as she's trying to cross the border. And sometimes she's being raped in the presence of her husband. And after they rape her, they ask the husband to sleep with her as well. That's, you, you don't want that. Why should we make things in you know, life so difficult for, for Africans simply because we, 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 we don't want to address these uh, colonial legacies? I will end there. Thank you. Thank you very much again to both of you for engaging in such a fascinating debate. And thank you to all the attendants for asking all these great questions. Now, before we finish, I would like to tell you that we have more webinars at the Migration Policy Center coming soon in the next few weeks. And they cover migration and migration governance with a global perspective, different parts of the world and different regions. So you're very much invited to follow our YouTube page. Thank you again for joining us. I hope to see you soon in the next events. Thank you. Thanks.